The 48-year-old man was despondent and attempted suicide by hanging. He was desperate not to die after he saw what he might be in for, and um, he desperately went, sought help from his wife, and she could not hear his cry, so he went into her body and could see and hear with her eyes and ears, and he made contact with her, and she exclaimed, oh my God, and she apparently knew what to do because she grabbed a knife, ran out to where her husband was hanging, and cut him down. So the, the implication is that she knew exactly where to go. Uh, third case is George Rodaniah. During his NDE, he was inside his wife's head, and she was in the process of picking out his grave and heard all her thoughts, and she was making a mental list of eligible men to date. Of course, now you have to re realize he had been pronounced dead, and he was in, in the freezer in the morgue, in the refrigerator in the morgue. So it was pretty clear that he was dead. Uh, and their characteristics as possible future husbands, so he later repeated all of those details to her, and again, this is in um, PMH's new book and also in an earlier book, and, uh, and basically she was really upset with him because she didn't have any privacy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now there's a new set of data from shared death experiences. Um, where, as Raymond was saying this morning, uh, a person at the bedside uh, in the presence of a dying loved one experiences a number of things, and he talked about these. Uh, but in particular, for our purposes, uh, one of the cases is where the body, uh, the body that is, say, the transcendent body or the mind body, we would say, of the deceased person passes through the person at the bedside. And there are four cases that he cited, that he's reported, uh, and this is what they said. Mild electric sensation, pulse of energy, these are different cases. Surge somewhat like an electric current, a jolt of energy. Notice the electric, uh, the connection with electricity and energy. Um, in another case that was reported initially by William Barrett um, in 1926, an apparently deceased person. Now, usually the interaction is with the person who's departing. But in this case, in some cases, the, you know, people come to meet. And in this case, uh, Walt Whitman, the, the person who was dying was a poet. Walt Whitman came and the person who was dying had conversation. He hadn't died yet, obviously. And, um, but the person at the bedside sensed that this was happening and um, and Walt Whitman, the apparently parent Walt Whitman, came and touched the hand of the uh, person who was attending the dying friend. And that person, again, felt as though I had touched a low electric charge. And then <coughs> the, the other form of, um, of interaction is where there's a mist forming over the uh, dying person's chest or head. And, um, the reports are that it has a depth and complex structure with layers of energetic motion in it, and or some kind of electri electricity like an electrical disturbance. Again, energy and electricity. And one of the points that Raymond makes in his book is that uh, NDEs, or S S NDEs and shared death experience, SDEs, uh, and other near-death phenomena, phenomena at the time of death, form a continuum, and I think it's quite appropriate to put all of these cases together as evidence of interaction. What's Shared death experience. Okay, there is a different set of phenomena we'll just uh, go through uh, briefly, which is work that we've done with a woman who has a phantom limb. A phantom limb is a distinct, distinct subjective experience of an absent physical limb. Uh, this woman was born without the fingers of her left hand, and um, she experiences streaming from, from those, from her finger buds, uh, which you can see, you can see here, her finger buds, particularly her thumb. So there's a streaming, and she can find out where the end of her finger is. She, she starts here, oh, that's where the thumb is, okay. Okay, well, the end of my thumb is right here, and of course her thumb is about that big. Okay, so she's up here. Now she can, 
Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> the most interesting of the phenomena are when she touches another subject, especially when she touches someone in the region of the brain. Uh, and that touch, now, what she's doing is she's not touching them physically. You can see her hand here, uh, which is hovering over the, over the head. And these are the yellow spots of where she had done it before. And here's her hand at the back of another subject's head. And uh, one of the most uh, I interesting things that is uh, described from several subjects is that there are distinct, unusual inner images that are really there, and they weren't there before, and they are unexpected. Um, colors, shapes, <coughs> for example, a black circle with a white ring, objects like a tree, a seagull, a fire hydrant, a sailboat, um, and uh, objects that are accompanied by other senses, smells, tastes, textures, for example, purple grapes, uh, where you taste not only the, the tartness of the skin, but you also taste the, uh, and feel the um, sweetness and um, slipperiness of the inner part of a purple grape. Um, custard, um, its texture as w and taste as well as um, smell, and strawberries. And uh, let me just go back to here. These uh, visual images usually happen at the, uh, the colors happen at the back of the head, the occipital lobe, the shapes and so on are happening uh, usually, usually when we, uh, um, when she touches the temporal lobes uh, as well as these sh objects that with the, the other senses. And personal memories of where MG is touching uh, the frontal lobes. Um, and those do not always, in fact, there's, only, there's not a good correlation between this, the actual neural functions that are happening in those parts of the brain. For example, colors can happen in areas you wouldn't expect. So there's more work we need to do. There are also definite physiological sensations, warmth, pressure in the head, and if she's touching your face or limbs, there's also that pressure. There is a distinct flushing, in this case, this woman's, this subject's young woman's uh, case where, she, where MG was touching back here, we think that there was a connection with the hypothalamus because the subject reported warmth and her face, and you can see it here on her neck and her face here somewhat, um, got very red. We would say beet red. Okay, and then... Um, when MG, now these are less important, but when MG touches an object, her, she feels herself in the finger buds, uh, sensations and physical reactions. And, um, and this is reported in the literature in at least a dozen cases where a phantom limb can be touched by an energy healer, a therapeutic uh, touch or Reiki um, and so on. Uh, and the, the, the therapist, feels it, and the patient feels it. And the patient can say, even if it's not looking, he's not looking, oh, you're touching my foot, my phantom foot, and it feels really good. Uh, and this is also reported by MG. And phantom limbs can be seen. At least in one case, there's a woman who, lost, who was born without e either legs or arms. And so, but she had distinct phantom experiences and she says, in darkness, I've noted a faint glowing of my phantom body parts. And MG also reports that she can see sometimes, especially against a dark background, her phantom fingers. Well, these results imply that the interactions are present, but they're very subtle or weak, and uh, we have more work to do there. Um, and we conclude, at least tentatively, that phantom limbs are objectively real extensions beyond the physical body similar to an NDE body. So that's another uh, area of evidence. So what does it take, sorry, what, what does all this tell us about uh, the non-material mind interacting? <clears throat> What's the mechanism? Well, first of all, the, the mind-brain interaction must ultimately resolve to physical processes. Ultimately, you must have 
neural activity. Um, and uh, so if the mind is interacting, the mind has got to be responding to neural activity and producing neural activity. Um, and, and so more specifically, it, whatever it is, however the mind is structured or works, it has to interact with electromagnetic uh, or light waves to produce perception. It has to interact weakly with atoms and molecules uh, to produce sensations and also to emit ultraviolet light. It has to interact readily with uh, neurons to, to, to evoke sensations uh, and to allow the, the phenomenon of NDE merging. And uh, it must have a structure that closely matches the finely differentiated neural structure of the brain. And, whoops, I didn't finish that. Uh, a promising possibility is finely differentiated structures of minute oscillating electric or magnetic dipoles. Well, it's got to be finely structured in order to match the brain, and it's got to be something that will interact with neurons and all of these other things. And one of the things that was proposed, first proposed by Kenny Arnett in uh, two articles in the Journal of Near-Death Studies, uh, is that it would be oscillating electric or magnetic dipoles, very finely structured, it has to be, and, um, and that's how the interaction could happen. But that model is, would explain, does explain, all of the forms of interaction that we've reported, that have been reported. So how could this possibly work? Um, first of all, some background. We've got to teach you neuroscience here first. Um, the neural activity is, is associated with, uh, asso the neural activity that is associated with consciousness occurs in the outermost two and a half or three millimeters of gray matter, which is what you see here in the picture, and, and uh, including in the folds or sul sulci. Uh, of the brain. So the, the, you can see the gray matter goes that way and f into the folds and the mind has to be interacting that way too. But that's, that's where all of the uh, activity associated with consciousness, almost all of it, occurs. And then the most common <coughs> uh, brain cell is the pyramidal cell which has a pyramid shaped cell body. Here's a picture. Uh, that's the cell body right there. It's got a shape like a triangle, a pyramid, and uh, there's a, from the top of the pyramid, there's this long um, apical dendrite. A dendrite is a, an extension of the cell, and it ends in the apical tuft, and it, it, there are a number of what they call basal dendrites from the, from the cell body, and then from the base of the uh, cell body, there's this long axon which can branch out and go a number of different places. And what happens, well, next slide. What happens is that uh, impulses from other neurons can hit the dendrites. The dendrites are receiving uh, neural impulses and they travel down the, the dendrites to the cell body. And so they can come at the top, they can come in the middle, they can come uh, you know, in the basal dendrites and they travel, they all travel down. And when they add up to, so to say, enough, then the cell body itself produces an action potential or fires an impulse down its axon. And that could branch out however the axon is structured and go to other neurons. So that's how that works. Oh, by the way, the um, gray matter is structured in six layers, which we'll talk about. Uh, but the, the, the the sum of this length is about two and a half millimeters. So there are different types of neurons located in the different areas of the gray matter. And most of these are pyramidal cells and they occur in the different layers. Where the cell body is, in the, what layer it's in, and that's the kind of neuron it is. So this is a layer two pyramidal neuron. It has a short, only a little ways to go up to layer one and, and that's its apical dendrite. And uh, layer three is longer and a longer apical dendrite. And layer five down here is longer still, a very long apical dendrite. And there are also layer six pyramidal cells which uh, only go up to layer four. And there's, there are other cells in layer four which are not 
pyramidal cells are called stellate neurons. Stellate neurons. Uh, 